Peter, chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for the sins of the righteous, for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Jude 6 through 7. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Hello, this is Dr. Steve Kibler with the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for today and beyond. I really appreciate you who follow this channel. I, I think what is being covered here is imperative for the Christian to understand and to share with others, Christian or non-Christian. And I realize this channel is not flashy or impressive, but I hope the text of the message resonates. I am a simple, educated, country boy redneck who is a pastor and a Christian school administrator. I love to hunt, to hike, to camp, to fish, spending time with my wonderful wife of nearly 40 years. But most of all, I love my God and Savior and His Word, and I am compelled to share its truth. So please help me share this by sharing it with others. I feel the time is short, so let's get the Word out. I started off today's video with two controversial New Testament passages that have everything to do with where we are headed in our study and headed in our experience here on planet Earth. As I write this, Russia has invaded uh, Ukraine uh, this week. Uh, and I, a Ukraine member of parliament stated that they were willing to fight Russia because Russia threatens the new world order. Now, there is nothing political about what I am about to say. Right? I'm not going to, we're not delving into politics here or in future videos because I think the new world order is not all about politics. It's all about the unseen realm that we have been uh, presenting uh, these past few weeks in the spiritual battle that has been raging for millennium and might be close to a conclusion. At least it's rearing its ugly head in the form of war. Now, I realize that Jesus, when asked by his disciples when the end was coming, he said there will be wars and rumors of wars. Well, at least that's where we are. So there would be like birth pains. So just with that in the backdrop, <clears throat> we're not taking sides. We're just recounting what was said by those that are involved. And the reality is, is there is unrest. There's unrest. There is not peace. It's just that sometimes the unpeace looks more like war. 
But just because there's not war doesn't mean there's peace. Because there's always rebellion. It's just not always as noticeable. So, there is more than meets the eye. Uh, there's more to everything that meets the eye. Now, we have looked at the biblical text regarding um, the certain extraterrestrial beings, the cherubim, the seraphim, and angels in general. And now we're going to begin to look at another class of spiritual beings, the class of extraterrestrials, that are called gods. More specifically, sons of God, but also referred to in the scripture as gods. Now that's always in scripture, in the biblical text, in the Hebrew, is always a small g, O-D, small Elohim, not a personal pronoun uh, or name for God, but Elohim means a member of that unseen spiritual divine realm. So we've looked at the biblical text recording the certain extraterrestrial beings and all of these things. But now we want to concentrate on those that are termed as sons of God or gods. So I started this conversation in the last video about what should a Christian believe about polytheism. And we noted that God in Jesus believed in numerous spiritual beings and the biblical text itself gives evidence of multiple spiritual beings, something that cannot be denied. The first evidence we have in the Bible text of this multiple God or sons of God, possibly, uh, is in the context in Genesis 1. Now listen to what the text says. And this is a very accurate translation of the Hebrew text. Then God said, Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. One cannot escape the conclusion that let us make man in our image and after our likeness is in the plural. The common and easy way to rationalize this is to say, well, the plural form of the word Elohim refers to the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But then we must ask ourselves, why would the Trinity need to have a conversation if they are one and the same? They're of the same essence. One could not start a conversation with the without the other one already knowing what was being said. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. Now, I used to be of the opinion that that was speaking of the triunity, but upon looking at it in other biblical texts, I'm not so sure. Because it becomes more evident in the next verse, actually, the next piece changes the tense from plural to singular. Where it said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Then in verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. May, uh, male and female, he created them. Now we have a problem to deal with. If it is the, tri, uh, the Trinity or the Triunity speaking with each other in verse 26, where are the other two members of the Godhead in the creation of man? When man is made, the noun, the proper noun, is singular in form. This is just something we have to deal with. Is there more going on than meets the eye? Or... 
You know, what is that possible answer? Well, I believe the biblical text does give another very viable option if we are willing to receive it. So we're going to go to another uh, book in the Bible. Uh, we're going to go to Psalms, and it's Psalms 82. Psalms 82, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. That's council. It's a gathering of people. It's not giving wisdom, like counseling, but it's a council. C-O-U-N-I-C-I-L, uh, council. It's a group of uh, entities that are gathered together. So God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. So it's Elohim, God, has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the Elohim gods. He holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak. And the fathers, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are Elohim. You are God's. Sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O Elohim, Most High God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. So now we have to deal with something that many just skim over. They don't pay attention to. They don't want to address. If all scripture is God breathed, inspired by God, and is true, then we must deal with these difficult biblical texts and try to understand it. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. The biblical text tells us there are more gods, and we're going to call them small g, o, d, right? Small g, gods, in this cosmic reality, and that the Lord God is the most high God, and he takes his place at the head and stands in judgment over these other gods. Small g gods. Now, we're going to look at this passage in future videos. But for right now, we need to see and need to at least need to begin to accept the reality of a number of small g gods with the most high God as their superior in authority and power because he is the one who judges them. Okay? So, just let that sink in for a moment. <clears throat> for some, this is a faith shake. A crisis of faith. Because we've been told that there is only one God. Well, there is only one like God. There are no other gods like God. He is the most high. But these exclusionary statements in the scripture in no way determine that there are no other entities. As we mentioned before, how can God be the most high if there's not something to be most high of? If he's not the most high God, how can there not be lesser gods that he's the most high of? Maybe you have never seen 
this biblical text before in Psalms 82. It's one of those pieces of scripture that many preachers and Bible teachers just don't talk about. And you can see why. If you have been taught that an acceptance of a polytheistic view is wrong, this is impossible to explain away. And be honest and be diligent with the biblical text. So, <clears throat> let's just let the biblical text say what it says. And then we have to accept it. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Just take it at face value and believe what the biblical text says. God informs these small g gods, these divine entities, these extraterrestrials, that they have not been performing their assigned duties correctly. He tells them, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Then uh, we read in, in verse 5 that the people, because of how wrongly the these smaller the small g gods have uh, been how they have been derelict in their duties that mankind have neither knowledge nor understanding and walk in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are shaken the text shows that these lesser gods had responsibility to guide humanity according to the most high gods dictates but they turned from the most high and began to mislead and misdirect they began to operate unjustly to the point that the knowledge and understanding of the most high god was not communicated and the people walked in darkness instead so this is very similar to what we read in first john in chapters one, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So at a minimum, we can assert that the scripture, the biblical text, teaches about a multitude of divine beings that are referred to as gods, small g gods, and are subject to the Most High. We learn about those beings in other writings, sometimes referred to as apocryphal writings, um, uh, pseudepigrapha. Uh, they're, they weren't included in the canon that we call the Bible today. But these are writings that are not included in the Protestant Bible. There are other Bibles that are different from the one that you were probably familiar with. <clears throat> you know, if you just look at the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, just the Hebrew text, uh, the Torah, and uh, the writings, and so forth, though, it has different book assignments and books in different order than our English version. It was reconstructed and mixed, and some of the the books that were uh, won in the uh, Hebrew can uh, text uh, writings were split apart. You know, Kings 1 and 2, Chronicles 1 and 2. Now they were one, now they're two. And they're in a different order. The New, uh, the New Testament, uh, uh, it's a, uh, the, the, the best that we can determine, it was canonized or put together around the, the 4th century. So around 397, it was ratified that there was a group, uh, the Council of Carthage, that was under the Roman Catholic Church. And they got together and said, okay, we're going to accept these writings, but not these writings. And we're going to put these writings in and call it this New Testament. And that was man who decided what was going to be in, in the New Testament. It was kind of man who decided what was going to be in the Old Testament, too. 
although our Bible is really two sets of different books, right? The Old Testament has different books in it. The New Testament has books in it. Uh, they were both put together at different times. The Bible didn't fall out of heaven. Uh, it was constructed, put together, was written over thousands of years. And it was put together at two different times, the old and the new. And then, then they were combined together in what uh, we are familiar with as the Bible. Many church fathers, and these were the early church fathers in the three, four, five hundreds. Um, Athagnarus, Clement of uh, Alexandria, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, they believed that there was at least one other book that should have been included in the canon. They couldn't figure out why it wasn't. And that was the book of Enoch. They believed it was scripture, that it was holy scripture. And that should have been included in the canon. Uh, Tertullian wrote around 200 AD that the book of Enoch had been rejected by the Jews because it contained prophecies pertaining to the Christ. And if you read the book of Enoch, you can see why it might have been rejected from the Old Testament or the Hebrew canon. What's interesting to note is that New Testament writers believed that the book of Enoch was authoritative. It was authoritative. But remember that the New Testament writers didn't have what we call the New Testament. They were writing it. They had no say as to what later, hundreds of years later, would be collected would be preserved and would be collected and would be accepted by a committee. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever sat on a committee before. Uh, it's hard to say that, that everything that's right actually gets done because there's always concession, right? There's always concession. And uh, we see this in our in our political system, so forth. That, well, if you want me to vote for this, then you're going to have to vote for this. Or if you want me to vote for this, then um, I, you know, you can't vote for that. And so we see that it went through this this committee process, and uh, who knows what really what really happened. But that's the way the New Testament, the Bible, came together. It was through a committee process and. And what we have to believe is, is at least we have enough that has been preserved that we can use, that we have the information that we need and for God and salvation. And, uh, but remember, the New Testament writers didn't have the, the New Testament to open up and read. It was just a series of letters and manuscripts that had been sent around. Um, so... What I want to look at is, this is, I thought this was really interesting, and I'm going to read out of Matthew 22, 29 through 30. And as usual, I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version, because I think it, it's been credited as being the most accurate, based on uh, the most ancient manuscripts. So in Matthew uh, 22, 29 through 30, we read this. But Jesus answered them. Now they were questioning Jesus <clears throat> about uh, who would be the husband and wife of who. If this woman had four husbands and they died, she married, and then husband died, she married, and husband died, she married, and husband died. Uh, who would be married to who after the resurrection, right? At the resurrection in heaven. So Jesus answered them and he said, you are wrong. Because you do, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Let me read that again. You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
but are like angels in heaven. Now, a lot of times that's, that's a verse that's referred to as authoritative. Jesus said it himself. And uh, there are uh, a lot of, a lot of people, Bible scholars, uh, preachers, teachers, and so forth. They say, see, uh, angels or these divine beings, uh, they can't have sex or they can't procreate. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about a, a relationship, a marriage relationship of husband and wife, number one. Number two, it's saying that humans are not like angels or these divine beings. Remember in the Greek, usually angel refer, it's used as a catchphrase to contain all extraterrestrial or all uh, divine beings uh, that have been created. It says they neither marry or given to marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So the inference is that angels in heaven, and this is important, angels in heaven. Angels in heaven. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now, it's talking about a marriage relationship, and it's talking about a particular being, living being, created being, extraterrestrial, divine being, angel, in heaven. That's a location. That's a, that's a place. Well, like the angels in heaven. Now, where... Since they didn't have the New Testament to read, we can't read in the New Testament. Jesus was speaking and he was saying, you don't know the scriptures. And he was referring to the Old Testament scriptures or what they believe were Old Testament scriptures. So where in scripture is Jesus referring to? What scripture is Jesus referring to that says angels neither marry or are given in marriage? Angels in heaven neither marry nor are given in marriage. Where is that? Well, if you do a search, and I don't, a quick search or a long search, there is no reference in the Hebrew text in our Bibles that communicates anything of this sort. No text, no verse in any of the Old Testament books that say angels don't marry. You know, angels in heaven don't marry or are given a marriage. So if Jesus is saying you don't know the scripture or God's power for in heaven, these folks are like the angels in heaven. They're never, they're, they're, there's no marriage or they're given in marriage as the angels in heaven. Where is that scripture? Well, interesting enough, we do find that in Enoch 19. 6 through 7. Now remember, Enoch is not included in our canon of scripture. But we do find this. But you, and this is a reference to angels, uh, from the beginning were made spiritual, possessing a life which is eternal and not subject to death forever. Therefore, I made not wives for you, the angels, because being spiritual, your dwelling is in heaven. So, it seems apparent that Jesus himself is referring to a familiar piece of text that was authoritative that spoke about angels not marrying or being given in marriage, the angels in heaven. Right? We find that in Enoch. We don't find that in any of the Old Testament books in our canon. So now let's look at another verse. Uh, we read these up front. And this is 1 Peter, and then we'll look at Jude. So 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. So to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patient waned uh, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared. And then in Jude, we read this. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, uh, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, 
and pursued unnatural desires. Serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. These references that we find in 1 Peter and Jude to the spirits in prison and these angels, divine beings, kept in eternal chains, they are references to these divine beings called watchers in the book of Enoch. And the biblical book of Daniel also uses the term watcher when referring to this divine type of being. So we have that connection. What I'm suggesting is this. And there are many more pieces of evidence, and we will be looking at these, but Jesus referred to this book, Enoch, it seems very, very, very likely, in the New Testament writers, when we read about these divine beings being locked in chains of gloomy darkness because they left their own abode and they followed after unnatural relationships is a direct correspondence to what took place in Genesis chapter 6 before the flood. Where it says, and the sons of God came down and they saw the women of men, how beautiful they were, and they took for themselves wives. And they had offspring. And the Nephilim, uh, the giants, were in, uh, were then at that time and also afterwards. So we see that the conclusion that Scripture comes to is that these, these spirits, these divine beings, chained in gloomy darkness because they left their own abode, they left their own position. And they followed after and had unnatural relations with human women. Those divine beings are called the sons of God. And those that did that in Genesis chapter 6 that cohabitated and had uh, relations with the women of men and offspring, they are locked in the pit, in chains of in gloomy darkness. So, this is what First Peter refers to, and this is what Jude refers to. And uh, we find a lot of uh, text support in the book of Enoch that really supports the Bible in that period of time during Genesis chapter 6. Okay, so I say all of that to say this. If the biblical text refers to another writing that is considered accurate, truth, and quoted from, I think it's absolutely fine to consider it as authoritative, especially as a historical document and a commentary on the biblical text. These little G-gods have played an important but not a positive role in events of human history from the very beginning. The reality is there are spiritual forces and spiritual foes to the Most High God other than Satan. And they are not just demons. And we'll, we'll look at demons later. This is not referring to demons. Uh, the demons are scriptural. They do exist. But these texts are not speaking about demons. They're speaking about the sons of God. They're speaking about these small g gods. And they have been antagonistic towards God. We see that in First Peter and in Jude. And that's why I really wanted to bring in the New Testament text. And to see that it refers back to what happened in the Old Testament text at the, at the, uh, before the flood and why the flood was actually uh, judgment, what really was taking place then. So we'll be looking at those verses and others next week as we build the biblical case for why things are the way they are in this world. And it's not all good. It's not all good. 
So this is Dr. Steve Kibler for the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for the day and beyond. Know the truth, stand on the truth, speak the truth. God bless you.